The seven habits of highly effective people. Now I know what you're thinking. What this is such a self helpy book. <laughs> like what are we doing talking about this book? But and I thought that too <laughs> when it was first brought up. But after reading through the seven habits of highly effective people, which was released in what? Was it eighty nine? Something like that. It was, like, it was back in the 80s. It was, it was, it's an old book. It's been around for a long time. People's grandparents probably read it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> But it's, it's really like a step-by-step -step book to go from being just a self-centered, sleepwalking idiot to becoming an effective person, like in the Jordan Peterson sense of the word. It's really just the nuts and bolts. You know, how do you actually become somebody who is... Like a, you know, like a, a loving partner, you know, you have good relationships, healthy relationships, you don't ignore the important things in your life. Um, you are effective at managing your time and, and doing not just, you know, managing your time, but actually doing things that matter for, um, for yourself and for, you know, people around you. It's like having a vision for life that is, you know, just completely, uh, radically different than you know just some other kind of you know how do i become an effective businessman how to become a millionaire in seven days or how to you know heal your inner child or it's 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 much more pragmatic and mature than than all of that well um one of the things that covey talks about in the book is how he came to these principles like uh these seven habits that he calls them and part of that was that I believe it was for his like for some kind of master's degree or something. For, he he wrote a he wrote a like a dissertation on the self help field, and so he read like hundreds and hundreds of self help books going back like all through American history. So as long as there's been publishing in the, in the United States, there have been self help books of various sorts. And he found that um, that early that for the first like 200 years or so like up until what was it world war ii or something like that something relatively recent up until then all of the self help self help strategies were character based kind of going back to the classics the greek and roman philosophical traditions so building up your character after that like in the kind of modern media age that changed to what he calls the personality centered approach which is really kind of this utilitarian um kind of just social engineering but self engineering strategy dealing like purely with surface level um features of your personality how, how to win friends and influence people right it was it's all like it, it's all it's well it's pretty much manipulation for the sake of manipulation there's there's no heart to it there's not there's no authenticity or integrity in those systems at least that's how covey sees them and so he basically what what these are is uh, he's it's not it's not like a get rich quick scheme or how to you know how to effectively manage people um which we can see like which is which is the trend even today <clears throat> when you look at not only self help books or a lot of them but um just kind of trends in um like persuasion if you go on youtube like there's the whole like uh pickup artist like a uh, scene and um, you know, and related kind of fields to that where it's all about basically, you know, how to, how to manipulate people, how to present yourself in a certain way to get what you want essentially. Mm -hmm. And that's as deep as it goes for Covey. It's not like that is like success, like being a highly effective person and the success that that brings is more of a, a natural outgrowth of the person's character. So he focuses exclusively on the principles, on the character principles that will, that will allow you to, um, to be the kind of person that can, that can then become successful. Mm -hmm. It's not like how, here's how to make a million dollars. It's here's how to be a good person. And with, with that character basis, then you can't help but be successful, like in whatever you're doing, you know, it doesn't have to be making money. It can be in any field. And the, and the thing about, the thing about that, about being, a, being character centered is that it applies to all types of fields and all types of, um, contexts and situations and environments. So, you can, um, you can be an entrepreneur who's seeking yeah. to 
uh, get a million dollars, but that is not the driving uh, force behind what you're doing. The driving mm-hmm. force is to be an individual who lives with integrity and uh, applies these values in their life and lives by those values. And as a consequence, if you're applying this into your field of entrepreneurship, if you're successful at it because you've lived by your principles, then that will come out as an outgrowth. Mm -hmm. But it is not the be-all, end-all, which is, like you said, very shallow. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Corey, you started out by kind of comparing it to the uh, instruction and ideas that uh, Jordan Peterson presents so well in, in his work. And uh, there's a reason why Seven Habits has, has become this kind of mega popular self-help book um, and, and has maintained that status for so many decades, I think. And that is because, uh, you know, like Covey says, the, the, the truths that he's conveying and communicating in his book uh, really are perennial truths, really do harken back to um, the the wisdom of the self and, and building character as a means of uh, becoming successful in life, in any endeavor. And, um, and so uh, I was surprised, um, pleasantly surprised by, by how well this is written and how practical a lot of this is as well. Um, he... What, he, what he's asking the reader to do, basically, is to kind of engage their own imagination and conscience uh, in many instances um, in writing exercises and thinking exercises um, that, would, that would propel uh, the reader forward in imagining the type of life uh, they would have liked to live or, or the type of goal that they would like to um, achieve as an outgrowth of, of taking responsibility for themselves and, and how they behave towards others. Um, and that's one of the chief kind of, um, positive things about this book, uh, which is just that it is self-directed. It is all about, um, he's got a very interesting, uh, term for it. He calls it an, an inside out approach. Um, which is to start with oneself, to not see the problems as the problems in one's life as as being uh, thrust upon you or make you feel like you're a victim of circumstance, but to uh, see them as opportunities to respond constructively. Um, and when you do that, you take your your kind of poor me victim mentality out of the equation. And you have the potential, at least, to grow as a result of responding to things with, uh, with some amount of um, constructive behavior and thinking. Um, so that's, that's just a kind of a, a general outline uh, yeah, from what just, I understood. Yeah, just kind of fleshing the, the outline out a little bit. Um, so he... He talks about like three different kinds of maturity, um, like the maturity continuum. And one is the dependent person, which clearly a child is the ultimate dependent person. But um, you can be intellectually, emotionally, physically dependent on other people for, you know, well into, well into adulthood. And um, after that, you know, there comes like a, a, you know, independence. You can be intellectually independent, physically independent, emotionally independent. But then finally, there's the the interdependence, which is where real maturity blossoms. And at that stage, you're, um, you know, you're able to do accomplish things with other people. You're able to delegate tasks. So a lot, a large part of that uh, of his book is to try and get you from moving from the dependent into the independent. And then, you know, because you can't do anything unless you're an independent person, you can't really accomplish anything. All hope for effectiveness is, is pretty much uh, dead on arrival until you're an independent person. But just because you're independent doesn't mean that you're going to be effective. Mm-hmm. And so then, you know, you, you move through what he calls like the private and public victories. So your private victory is basically kind of a mastery over yourself and your, your emotions and, you know, that that inside out approach is one 
uh, element of of that, you know, of all the exercises that he gives and the, you know, the just the the whole those three um, habits, and then the public victory is, you know, more moving into interde interdependence, where you're effective with other people, you become like more of a leader, a better manager, a better, you know, husband or whatever, and you know, the fruits start to bear themselves out. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to read a quote that he. A uh, quote from the book on those three levels of maturity. So Covey writes, Dependence means you need others to get what you need. All of us began life as an infant, depending on others for nurturing and sustenance. I may be intellectually dependent on others' thinking. I may be emotionally dependent on other people's affirmation and validation of me. Dependence is the attitude of you. You take care of me. Or you don't come through, and I blame you for the result. Independence means you are pretty much free from the external influences and support of others. Independence is the attitude of I. It is the avowed goal of many individuals and also many social movements to enthrone independence as the highest level of achievement, but it is not the ultimate goal in effective living. There is a far more mature and more advanced level. The third and highest level in, in the maturity continuum is interdependence. We live in an interdependent reality. Interdependence is essential for good leaders, good team players, a successful marriage or family life in organizations. Interdependence is the attitude of we. We can cooperate. We can be a team. We can combine our talents. So there's, there's a lot in there. Like the whole book is kind of structured around that, how basically the, I think it's the first three habits are effectively independence habits. It's, it's to, it's to become your own person, to, to not be dependent on others, to, to be truly <clears throat> independent, because you need to be in order to get to the independent, uh, interdependent level. And then the three, uh, the next three um, habits are basically being effective by working with others, like the like his win-win or no deal principle, where he basically says, you know, there are various attitudes towards um, competition and uh, like negotiating, whether that's in business or in relationships. And there are various attitudes that you can take, like a lose-lose, lose-win, or just win-win, which is just, just the base negotiation where, uh, basically compromise. Um, but there's a level on top of that, which he, which he calls something like, well, it ver he uses various like mathematical analogies at various times, but it's basically one plus one doesn't equal two. One plus one equals three or five or 10,000 or 50,000. Because when you have two potentially conflicting um, wants on either side of, you know, the, the conflict, the, the, the best ideal to strive for is a, an outcome that benefits both. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the, getting into the synergy aspect where you, create some, you can create something that's, that is better than either of the parts. So the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. <coughs> and... Um, <clears throat> so the whole book is structured on this maturity continuum, but one of the points that he made that, um, that I was glad that he made was that <clears throat> you can't get to inter interdependence without independence. It's like there's no jump from dependence to interdependence. Like you have to be become your own person first. And that like, so there's even some, um, maybe not explicit, but some, somewhat of an overlap with uh, Dabrowski's work about there's this multi-level approach that um, that there are like distinct levels of being levels of like of character and and um, and some people are stuck on some levels but so, so this his framework basically to me one of the kind of areas my mind went when reading it was that he kind of explains like accounts for and like gives their right due to both the kind of independence, the, the people that, um, like he said, the people that strive for independence, but also the impulse that either the same people or other people will have towards a more kind of community-oriented um, aspect or like way of living. So you can see those exemplified in like the, the rugged, individualism of like of capitalism and like the image that has in the world of like me first and then the the kind of communist like collective um 
on, on the macro scale or the communal communal living mm-hmm. like um, um, like hippie kind of stuff on on the other but they're both kind of like incomplete because the, they're like they're well there are so many people and and in any kind of society or group of large people you're going to get these varieties you're going to have people who are dependent either because of like something through no fault of their own like there are you know some people with various like uh, you know genetic conditions or um, um, or diseases or um, or injuries who can't be independent on cer- on certain levels like they're not like the, um, they may be fi- they may be physically dependent on other people in order to survive um, but there are also people who are dependent because they have just never learned or never put the effort into becoming dependent and th- and then for like for the people who who do kind of have the the character to be interdependent it's like that is that is something that well first of all it's an achievement in itself but also um it's like like you can't force you can't force interdependence on people like it is something that has to come from within so that's why um i think it's this book is kind of a good antidote to ideological movements that try to like impose a a morality on people mm-hmm. um like well we must be inter- interdependent so i'm going to force you to be interdependent when all that does is cause problems because it's not coming from the individual it like, takes character out of the equation right and and self betterment and and a conscious uh, a kind of um, self-directed conscious movement and an aim on the part of the individual who seeks to better themselves because no one is going to, you know, people who are successful in life at any endeavor, um, they, they've had to do some work on it uh, unless they're, you know, master manipulators and have, or, or have um, inherited uh, their positions through nepotism. Um, <laughs> like Joe Biden's son. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, I mean, this is uh, this is kind of the point. And just getting back to the the kind of ideological uh, dimension to it, Harrison, it, it would seem that you know, even if you were uh, born into the world at a great economic or social disadvantage, having these these ideas under your wing and putting work into it. Um, can lift you out at least to some extent mm-hmm. uh, and and make one you know and and in experiencing that self growth that that elevation of one 's abilities and and self actualization um, I think one comes to realize that they they 're less likely or prone to succumb to some uh overarching ideological um, philosophy that that would put responsibility on the on the betterment of their lives onto a system, as opposed to their own uh, their own resources and well, their own energy. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's uh, so. The book is divided into four parts, and the first part is all about paradigms and principles. So there is that paradigm that says, you know. It, you know, that just, that blames the world, you know, for whatever issues you have. So like you're saying, if you're born into poverty, you're born into some, some severe circumstances that, you know, there is definitely a voice in all of our heads and a voice, you know, just humanity in general that's, and, you know, you hear it a lot now with various social movements that says that this, you know, you're in this position because it's the world's fault, it's somebody's fault, um, patriarchy, you know, oppression, you know, it's somebody's fault. And of course, in a lot of cases, yeah, there is there is a lot of merit to that. There's somebody probably, you know, in different cases that you know, whatever oppression, whatever crimes that were committed, yeah, they they were occurred and they came from the outside, and you have to live with it. But then there's like he points out in that whole paradigm, there's a paradigm shift where you you take into consideration the fact that you have, you know, that you're a part of this story, that you have some determining power in how this story ends. And, you know, so you don't want to give all of that power away to the outside world, because at that point you become a reactive puppet. 
basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he doesn't say that, but you know, in those words, but in so many words, that's what you are. You're a reactive puppet with no, you know, self determination or or free will, and you give that up by allowing, you know, these other forces to dictate to you what you can or can't do in the world. So you have to at least start with the understanding that you do have a role to play. And so, you know, at that first part of the book is all about changing that paradigm and changing a number of different paradigms before you moving into the the different habits in part two, which are part of that private victory over your own self. You know, that's, this is when you, um, you know, when, when you become an independent person, really, once you become independent from all of the, you know, slave to your emotions and your whims and events and circumstances. And in the, the first habit, he talks about being proactive, of having a personal vision, you know, and establishing a personal vision and a personal mission statement. And the second habit is uh, beginning with the end in mind. Now, you know, you can't really have just these habits individually. You know, I think it's, you know, you, you basically develop them all at the same time. Um, and the third habit is, you know, put first things first. And, you know, one phrase that I liked out of that, that part was um, that managers do things right and leaders do the right things. Mm-hmm. So you have to take personal um, leadership over yourself and establish values, you know, through this whole process, establish values so that when you're spending time, you're doing things, you're not just making to-do lists. You're not just focusing on the day. You're not just focusing on, on things that are important and urgent and living in constant crisis mode, but that you're also, you're, you're putting things that are important and not urgent into the you know, into your field of vision, which is establishing relationships, building relationships, building trust, being somebody who you would respect, you know, taking care of others and being proactive about all of it, you know, to going back to your mission statement, which kind of comes out of, you know, beginning with the end in mind, you know, beginning with like he, he said, like basically preparing for your death. Like when you do it, you know, when you're, you, you just do a thought experiment, think about you're in your casket and there are people, they're talking about you. And it's like, well, what do you want them to say about you? What do you want your family members to say about you? What do you want, you know, work uh, colleagues to say about you? What do you want your church to say about you? You know, you, this is the, the vision of your life, the person that you want to be and the, everything else you subordinate to those, to those visions. So then you become a leader of at least yourself you become you're able to decide what is important what and 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 act on that in accordance with your deepest you know values the the things that you really hold most dear and you know and it is really i think a really big victory to be able to do that kind of thing because it's it's not easy <laughs> by any means it's a constant ongoing process where you're like well that actually didn't it turns out that wasn't as important to me as i thought you know you, there's all sorts of periods in our life where we we gather you know um values or ideas we look up to certain people we want to emulate those characters emul- emulate those traits you know achieve something and then maybe you achieve it or maybe you don't achieve it and you realize well that really wasn't that important to me deep you know in in my heart that wasn't that wasn't important it was like a false idol you know what i mean if for whatever reason whether you know you're a teenager and you look up to this rock star or like a rapper you know and or you know as you move on you're going to college you're getting like your master's degree and not, like your idols are all um these like these professors who have this you know published whatever papers or whatever and you, you know all of the all of the influence and in, all of the influences in life that are just kind of random you know you, you it takes a lot of work to cut through all of that and to get to the real the real heart of what you want to to live for you know what is you know what is the god in your life it's difficult to find that it's not very easy and it's interesting to me that you know in this book the, everything that he's published it's in uh it's so religious in nature but it is completely taken all of that the kind of religious um verbiage out of the equation so that it it's very it's just very secularized but i mean it, you would you would read this kind of material i think in a you know in um in a lot of different religious traditions this mm-hmm. are, these are very perennial religious character building ideas and it's interesting to me that you know that so many millions of people uh, have have 
received this message, and the world's still total garbage. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, somewhat on that note, um, about Covey himself, he's actually a Mormon, and um, you know, really involved in in the Mormon communities from Utah, and. But in the book, of course, like you said, it's it's pretty secularized. He talks about just well, I don't even know if he talks about it or if it was in um, you know one of the prefaces written by one of his family members or something like that, talking about how involved he was and um, you know in the in the religious aspect of his life and how he was you know he would he would always read scripture and and but that it doesn't come across in his book at least in that kind of preachy element, and even in the section um, I can't remember which habit it's under or if it was in the section on principles where he's talking about um like the different centers so these are the different uh um the different things that people be, will be centered towards like you have the you know the self censored censored person self centered person or the work centered person or the church centered person or the family centered person and he points out that um well he points out the negative aspects of all of these different centers because even in the ones that sound good, like, oh, family-centered or, or spouse-centered, centered, that sounds pretty good. But then he points out, well, no, you know, look at it a bit, deep, uh, a bit deeper. Like uh, a person who is spouse-centered, for instance, will make a decision just based on what their spouse wants. And that can lead to all kinds of resentment, um, you know, lack of um, fulfillment about what the, the individual, him or herself, actually wants in their life um, can create, you know, marital, marital and family problems or, or business or work problems. The church sense, censor, I keep messing up that word, <laughs> centered, the church centered person will be focused on like their church community and do everything for their church. And that'll always be the first thing in their mind. But, <clears throat> but that'll be on like one day of the week, maybe. And it doesn't say anything doesn't say anything about how that person acts in the rest of their life. You can have a, a like a highly church-centered person who is like totally active in their congregation, um, you know, out there doing all kinds of things, but is, who's still a pretty wretched person, like in real life. And and so I, I was kind of even um, while listening to it because I've been listening to the audiobook, I was like, well, you know, that's pretty that's pretty deep. You know, for especially for someone coming from a religious community, that he can, um, that he's, that he can and is willing and able to um, to criticize that kind of mentality. That there's kind of like there's a there's kind of a higher level of spirituality or religiosity that transcends that kind of just that group loyalty and um, that kind of rigid um, rigid just acceptance of of dogma and the social situation as it is. He's a very um, kind of, I'd say he's almost like a total anti-authoritarian because mm -hmm. he, like, he, he throughout the book he's he's constantly, um, constantly pointing out how bad it is just to accept the the social norms, you know, whatever they are, that that uh, you know the s social norms don't really mean anything. The, the only way they mean anything are if are if they do come from that from that individual perspective of character. That um, that the like the values of a society that's where they should be grounded in independent individuals who like live interdependently like um, and not not just like you know people with what we've you know called in the past moral exoskeletons who just adopt other people's values for themselves because then then you're dependent that's you're still at stage one there you're dependent on others for for your beliefs for your for your values. You're not even yet your own person. You can't. You can't be interdependent. Um, you can't be. You can't be a kind of like this active center in your community uh, on on any level. You know, from family upwards, when you are um, when you're dependent on society for anything, whether it's you know for physical physical well being and, and survival or um, you know emotional. Um, Emotional, not necessarily well-being, but just you know, you know, feeling good, feeling right, and at, at at and at ease, basically adjusted to your social environment, and um, and intellectually, just believing what other people tell you because that's the that's the norm. Like there's there's something very um, 
kind of withered and and brittle about that kind of dependence. It's there's there's nothing authentic to it. There's there it, it hasn't become your own. Mm-hmm. That's something that Jordan Peterson always talk talks about repeatedly as well is is like is the realization he came to as a as a young man that he was just spouting off other people's ideas that they hadn't become his yet and and well, that's a really hard thing to do it's it's first of all it's hard to realize it but then it's hard to actually you know make those ideas your own to to really put them to the test and it's on the other hand it's very easy to just accept what other people say and to to accept the norms like you're saying about you know going to school and your professors are your gods like it's very easy just to adopt their mentality and you see that well you see that repeatedly um you know i read a lot of books by academics and and as good as those books are what you often find is that the people in whatever field who are writing those books they've adopted their professors like um like new thing you see this in biblical studies a lot where you know one new one guy will have this new idea right and create a, a new kind of perspective on on looking at things and it can be a really good idea like kind of like avant-garde and and um um like novel and you know something that no one's ever looked at before or that's kind of seen as as somewhat subversive and it's like okay that's great and then all their students grow up get their phds start writing books and they're all this they're all in the same lineage essentially and again they can be really great books but they've They've just adopted their professors, you know, their gods' um, worldviews and these ideas, and that's that's created the framework for 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 their own work. And it's not just biblical studies; you see that everywhere. And and so, well, it's just a just a complex phenomenon, and uh, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> well, so um, getting back to your point about the uh, the, the centeredness. Uh, that certain people have towards things, um, be it family-centered or work-centered or self-centered. Um, I think I think part of his main point there, I would just add, is that uh, we can become so identified with um, these pseudo-priorities in our minds that are unexamined, uh, that have little to do with any kind of... A, values that we've established for ourselves, that there's a, a tendency for us to um, react to certain things automatically, mechanically, without due consideration towards um, it, its place and its priority in the vast scheme of things. So, for instance, if, a, if an individual has a family and a, um, and a, and a job, uh, and, and he's asked to uh, work overtime, for instance. This is one example that Covey gives. Um, you know, one possible flaw in automatically um, going to the job and, and, and taking the overtime would be in neglecting the family at a crucial moment or, to, or at a moment where uh, the, the employee and father has committed to a certain... Um, a certain activity, it, it, and and he's he really gives a kind of nuanced uh, explanation about all the variables involved in in such predicaments. But his point is that uh, we give our we seem to give our power away. We seem to lose uh, any kind of semblance of integrity we have with ourselves and with other people when we when we aren't considering. Um, how a, a choice towards putting our focus into one uh, sphere of activity um, can can draw away from another. Uh, so that, on a very kind of day to day practical level, I think gave me a lot of food for thought. I mean, you know, there are, there are times when I you know want that extra shift at work so I can make money, so I can pay for things which can be a very practical and necessary and important part of being responsible and, and functioning. And at the same time, I have to, uh, and, I, and, and he would actually criticize my use of the term have to, because he would say that, you know, I, I would... You don't have to. I, well, he would say that, I, you know, you're taking out choice, conscious 
choice in, in the equation. As soon as you insert the language of I have to, or I was told to, or I should have, um, when the whole point is, you know, I choose to, uh, which is, you know, I choose to knowing that I'm not going to make that money on that day, losing that shift or not taking that shift. I get, I get to put my energy into those things that are also of great value to me, be it, be it family or other responsibilities or even the self care, you know, going to a chiropractor if my job is physical, uh, that would um, enable me to uh, to just continue to be fit enough to do the job and to fulfill other responsibilities. So he's he's really quite uh, he's really uh, helping one to kind of uh, take a very balanced approach to responsibility. Uh, it, it's not so much about taking on more and you can do it in the superficial sense that, that many self-help books might otherwise be proponents of. But, but, that, um, but that to be in integrity with oneself uh, and one's values, which should be consciously examined and even written down. Um, you know, he talks about mission statements for groups, uh, organizations, uh, businesses, churches. But he also talks about having personal uh, mission statements, ideas out of which we, um, and, va and values that we hold ourselves to, uh, that can be expanded upon and worked on and, and, and created. Um, so I really like the way he, the way he stresses how important, uh, all of this, um, all of this can be, uh, if we engage in a conscious process of, of, self-examination and prioritizing. Um, so we're acting out of our values. And I thought it was interesting too, with his, um, coming in line with that, you've got, uh, something that at the very beginning of the book, he talks about with, um, the various different kind of cult of personality types. Um, you know, he has various quotes of different things. One of them that stuck out to me was Napoleon Hill's quote of, Anything the mind can conceive, it can, can, it can achieve. Or anything it can conceive and believe, it can achieve. And, you know, it, on one hand, like, you know, it, it makes sense. But it, it just, that and a lot of other self-help type uh, material, it just always rubbed me the wrong way for whatever reason. There was something about it that I couldn't quite get it. But with him, now I understand that these things are useful, but they're Band-Aids, they are built on wrong principles. And because they're built on wrong principles, uh, it's not a long lasting, uh, deep, deep change that's going to bring you to the place that you really actually do want to be. Um, and you have to define that for yourself by going in and creating your own mission statement, um, by doing like he recommended with the exercise of creating your own eulogy. So something that you want to, to be read because this is, you know, who you actually are. Mm -hmm. Right. I think one problem with a lot of that other self-help stuff is that it, it really just butchers the complexity of, yeah. of people. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it kind of comes at people like they're one dimensional, like you're just, a, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're just popular or, you know, just everything depends on how much money you make or how popular are, you are. And it, it doesn't really capture the complexity of how just all the different relationships all the different roles that we play the you know the the tragedies that can occur the you know history and and all of that kind of stuff in a way that Kobe really it seems like he 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 comes at it I guess probably maybe as a man of faith you know he has some of that maybe in there from his upbringing but it also you can also see that you know because he he includes a lot of vignettes and I think what he had nine children, mm -hmm. something like that. And that's a, that's a lot of mouths to feed. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of stress. It's a lot of sleepless nights and, you know, you know, keeping a relationship. And he went on with, date, date nights with all of the kids too. I mean, that's incredible. Um, the, uh, yeah, that's a lot of, that's a lot of work, uh, to be doing. So he includes a lot of vignettes on, you know, how he would, uh, work in order to make his family 
you know, healthy, make sure that his children grew up properly. You know, he definitely had a very principled way of interacting with, mm -hmm. with his whole family. And that comes through in terms of, you know, he's, he doesn't just see people as, uh, you know, in a superficial way, but in a much deeper way. Well, I just wanted to comment on his writing style and all the stories that he tells. I think it's in the introduction that he basically uh, thanks his wife for that aspect of his of his writing because uh, he said that you know she'd read everything that he that he wrote, but then you know always tell him, oh, well, you need to explain that a bit more, or that doesn't really work, and you oh, but you need to tell more stories. So there's lots of stories, and those are kind of for me those are the things that really kind of stuck out. Um, they're the most memorable, most memorable bits, I think, is to capture those things in stories. <clears throat> Just one that came to mind when you were saying that, Corey, was the one about um, he's working on the chapter, or he's, he's writing, and he, he, make, he says that, uh, funnily enough, he was writing on patience in his office, and he hears one of his sons just screaming, you know, outside to the, um, he's banging on the bathroom door and saying, let me in, let me in right now. And Covey, you know, gets up and he says, do you have any idea how, how um, irritating that is and distracting from, from what I'm working on? Now you go to your room and, uh, you know, think about what you did, essentially. And then, uh, then he, you know, turns around and looks and his other son is like sitting on the floor, like bleeding. And, uh, and then he realizes, oh, you know, crap. He find, and then the problem was, is that his, his kids were playing like, I don't know, like hockey or, you know, some kind of like ball game in the house and one of them got injured and the brother was knocking on the door because the one of his daughters was in the bathroom and wouldn't and had the door locked and wouldn't come out and he needed the the other son needed to get in there to get like a wet towel to clean up you know this injured son so he goes to the to the son and he apologizes he says oh i'm sorry you know i didn't i didn't realize uh, i didn't i didn't have a good grasp on the situation i made an assumption and uh, and um and the kid says, well, I'm never going to forgive you. I'm not forgiving you for this one. And he says, well, why, son? And he says, because you did this last week, too. And he, so that like, prompted a moment of self-reflection. Um, and for him, it was an example of, of um, you know, well, not, well, not only not getting a read on a situation, but you know, making those wrong assumptions in the heat of the moment without taking the time to, to see what's actually going on. And, uh, and his kid was naturally, you know, upset with him because I, I think he might have even used the, the image of the, what does he call it? The, the trust bank, basically, where like you, you earn up credit with people by, by the, you know, the, your interactions with them and you establish a, a certain level of emotional trust and, um, and basically a bank account with them. If you don't have any trust built up with someone, then... Um, you can't get away with anything basically because, uh, you know, there's, you don't have any credit with them. And so he'd, he'd slowly been, you know, with these incidents with his son, been taking deposits or, or, you know, taking withdrawals out of this account without putting in the, the right deposits. And, and he had, you know, so he had no currency with his son at this moment. So not forgiving you. <laughs> it's too much. And, and, uh, so just as an example of the, the, like the effort that has to go into every interaction and the and the the relationships that have to be established over time um like if he had been if he hadn't been distracted in these weeks um and, and had been focused on on you know making deposits into you know the account with his son that that this wouldn't have blown up in the way that it did and since he was writing on patience if he was you know um if he was practicing what he preached in this moment, he wouldn't have made that uh, that split second, you know, misjudgment of the situation. Um, that also makes him quite endearing. Is it mm -hmm. most of the stories are him screwing up, or a lot of the stories are him screwing up? Or you know, he also gives examples of of the you know the the good things that he did, the the right choices that he made, often with his wife, um, often in the, you know in their in the family life examples. But he also, or go ahead. I'll finish what you were going to say. Oh, I was going to go off in another direction. So well. Um, I, I was just wanted to say I was uh, I found his humility in in sharing a lot of his stories uh, quite endearing also, and um, where he's using his own life as an example of things he had learned. So he's not only drawing upon uh, kind of classic wisdom literature and and self help book ideas. 
but he's also, you know, saying, look, I'm, I'm fallible, but this is what I learned and you can learn it too. And, um, not quite with such a salesman's pitch though, I'm afraid. Uh, but, um, one of the stories that he told, which, uh, which was really quite interesting and stuck with me for quite a while was, uh, how his, one of his sons was facing, uh, academic failure and, and, and kind of failure as a, an athlete in, in his school. And, um, so, uh, Covey and his wife had, had both tried different strategies in, in terms of cheerleading and, and being supportive of their All of son. the things that the cult of personality tells you to do to motivate somebody to do something, manipulating. Uh, that, that's a good point. These are, these are all of the most kind of uh, superficial approaches towards helping, quote unquote, somebody. And, um, and they realized that, that these approaches were not helping uh, their son. And as a kind of first step, what they came to realize was that uh, they were really motivated out of their own kind of uh, self-importance and, and wanting to, um, they were seeing their son as a reflection of them, really. That, you know, his success as a reflection of their success or his failure as a reflection of their failure as, as parents. Uh, so they were very kind of externally um, identified with, with their child's failure. And uh, what they ended up doing and what he describes is that they ended up working on themselves and, and um, expanding their own being. And that's a, that's a word he uses uh, quite well on a number of occasions. And what I mean is, or what they meant, or what he meant in the book is that uh, instead of working to improve his son's standings, uh, they worked on improving their own, um, their own kind of acceptance of their son of, of where he was at and, and their own, um, uh, their own values and, and their own kind of aims in, in being, uh, good parents and, and role models. And it's from that that the son naturally had the space, I think, to, as he describes it, grow and move on to become a better athlete, um, you know, president of, of certain class associations and, and, a, and a good academic. Uh, but they had to get out of their son's way and they had to get out of their own way mm -hmm. in, in allowing themselves and in recognizing in themselves a, a space that they needed to grow into. Uh, and that, that's amazing to me. And I, I've, you know, I had to think about, um, some of the relationships in, in my life where, you know, there's this kind of, um, I don't know, just a, a, a fervor to help that isn't helpful at all, uh, or to give advice where it's not asked for or even necessarily, um, you know, the right thing to do at the time. Uh, so that's a, that's a big one. And, and, um, and I'll be sitting with it for a while. Yeah. Well, one of the things in that example, um, was like, he was kind of failing at baseball. And so they'd, at first they would be like, Oh, you know, just, uh, you know, that's okay. You'll do better next time. Just make sure you, you know, keep your eye on the ball and, you know, don't swing until, until the ball's coming at you because he, he was like swinging before the pitcher had even thrown the ball. You know, just as one example, and so one of the things that they decided was was to stop um, protecting him from like the the laughter and the like th and other people essentially making fun of him. They stopped protecting him from that. They exposed him to it and basically left him to his own devices. And they said it wasn't easy at first because he he was he lacked he he no longer had that protection from his parents shielding him from the um, the negative opinions of those around him. Because, like you said, they were, they were, he was like a reflection of, uh, his failure was a reflection on them of their failure. But when they let him fail on his own and deal with the, you know, the social um, tension and repercussions of that on his own, that actually 
was one of the things that led to him you know finding himself and and developing on his own was to to step back and actually actually um, expose him to the things that they previously wanted to shelter him from to protect him from so uh, so that, that's one of the things that stood out for me there is that when you when you first read that you think oh well that's it's kind of mean you know <laughs> not to protect your kid from those evil bullies but no it's like that's what he needed and um, and they weren't their their true motivation wasn't out of concern for him it was like you said out of you know their own self concern and what he real what he really needed for himself was you know to be able to um, well among other things to be able to just experience that and um, and then like you said it was a, it was a, su- a success and he even ended up excelling at uh, you know at, at athletics in addition to you know everything else so yeah that was a good one yeah. well here's a here's a quote um, you know there, there's one portion of the book that gets into uh, relationships and uh, where a uh, uh, somebody attending one of Covey's courses uh, or a colleague shares with Covey that um, he no longer loves his wife or, or feels love from his wife. And uh, they're, they're both uh, husband and wife, family-oriented, and care about the children very much, but you know they seem to be on this kind of precipice of uh, possibly divorcing one another. And, um, and so what Covey says is, so love your wife. And, uh, you know, the response from, uh, from the guy is like, well, what are you talking about? I'm sa- what I'm telling you is that I don't love her. She doesn't love me. So I'm asking you what I should do here. And Covey says, love your wife. So I just don't feel it anymore. The feeling isn't there. The feeling isn't there. So this is a quote uh, from the book, which... Uh, explains, I think, a very key principle um, to love. It's, it's probably, it's not the whole enchilada of, of love because uh, relationships are a complex thing. But certainly I think it goes a long way towards um, accounting for uh, failures in relationships and um, probably failures in a number of other endeavors and, and spheres of life that people experience all the time. Covey writes, in the great literature of all progressive societies, love is a verb. And by progressive, uh, he's not meaning it in the kind of ideological sense that we've kind of come to understand uh, today in contemporary politics. Um, But he goes on, reactive people make it love a feeling. They're driven by feelings. Hollywood has generally scripted us to believe that we are not responsible, that we are a product of our feelings. But the Hollywood script does not describe the reality. If our feelings control our actions, it is because we have abdicated our responsibility and empowered them to do so. Proactive people make love a verb. Love is something you do, the sacrifices you make the giving of self, like a mother bringing a newborn into the world. If you want to study love, study those who sacrifice for others, even for people who offend or do not love in return. If you are a parent, look at the love you have for the children you sacrificed for. Love is a value that is actualized through loving actions. Proactive people subordinate feelings to values. Love, the feeling, can be recaptured. So, in a sense, in a roundabout sense, Covey's advice is, you know, put some more kind of objective perspective into your relationship with someone in in actively loving them, and then see if those feelings don't naturally arise as a as a consequence of of that objective love. Um, I work, uh, I started a job about a year and a half ago and, uh, someone I work with was, uh, uh, when I was in UB, I was asking her something, probably not in the most appropriate way, but it was a kind of time sensitive situation. 
And this woman um, basically snapped and, and chewed my head off in the moment. And, um, and she has a reputation in, in the department I work in of, of being um, uh, kind of uh, reactive and, and snippy with people. So I understood that. But I also understood that um, by, by being the best work colleague that I could be, uh, by you know, just being respectful and working hard, um, I could possibly you know, have a nice relationship with this person. So my higher value was to just be able to work well with this individual since we all work closely together. And it worked. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that we, you know, we have a very nice working relationship right now. We're very pleasant to one another and, uh, and we talk to one another. So, uh, I, that, that's a rather mundane kind of, um, example of, of how this can work. Uh, but, um, it was an example to me of, of how my, my, my value for, of succeeding at, at this job I have and, um, and having everybody feel comfortable around me and, and reliant upon me to do a good job was motivation enough for me not to feel so self-important and insulted and hurt by her, by her snaps and her annoyance, uh, which are considerable. Um, so that's one thing. It's one example. And I'm sure, if, you know, if people look at their lives, they'll, they'll see times where they... Um, you know, they were reactive towards certain things and made the situation worse. Uh, and I have plenty of examples of that too. Uh, or when they were next week, uh, yeah, next week's show, <laughs> I'll tell you how I fucked up in about a dozen different ways <laughs> in all stupid manner that you can't possibly imagine. You'll be slapping your forehead for the, the remainder of the show. Um, but Covey describes this as a circle of concern uh, versus a circle of influence. And, uh, and his point was in making this distinction that we can, we can be self-concerned about how we look and we can be uh, reactive towards certain things, or we can try and take proactive approaches to, to life and situations that are uncomfortable. And in doing so, in acting out of, of uh, a greater value than, you know, my feelings were hurt, uh, we can create for ourselves a circle of influence where where we're able to um, work with people and get to that, that latter stage uh, that you were mentioning earlier, Harrison, of interdependence, of, of eventually having the ability to, to provide leadership in however a, a modest way um, in, in acting out of a higher value. I think one of the, the really beneficial aspect of this book, one of the best parts is his, uh, all, all the examples of insight that he has that, and that he shows that is possible. You know, if you can see that he can, he can see his value system, whatever internally for however he can, he has the, a, a good model of what his value system is and he knows when he's violating it. And, you know, he, he, he just basically shows by example how all these different paradigms that he's um, talking about, all of these different habits, are the fruit of looking at that and these deep insights into these laws of nature, you know, these, what he calls like, you know, laws of nature just like gravity, but they're ethical and they're moral laws. And what, is, what does he say? He says that you... Um, you can't break the law. This is a quote, but you can't break the law. You can only break yourself against it. And I think that is, you know, you see that time and time and again through, you know, personal experience or through, you know, experience with other people, members of the family. You just, you know, you see this is the, you know, if you do these things, you're going to keep getting the same results. And people just, you know, we all, we just break ourselves against the law, it seems. And, you know, one of the best things of this book or of people who have this kind of ethical character is that they come out, they come down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and they say, this is, this is why you all are so messed up. <laughs> you know, don't, stop acting like this. This is a higher law. And um, I, I really like how he described that. And so I want to read 
uh, a chapter or a, a portion from his part on the power of a paradigm. He says, suppose you wanted to arrive at a specific location in central Chicago. A street map of the city would be a great help to you in reaching your destination. But suppose you were given the wrong map. Through a printing error, the map labeled Chicago was actually a map of Detroit. Can you imagine the frustration, the ineffectiveness of trying to reach your destination? You might work on your behavior. You could try harder, be more diligent, double your speed, but your efforts would only succeed in getting you to the wrong place faster. You might work on your attitude. You could think more positively. You still wouldn't get to the right place, but perhaps you wouldn't care. Your attitude would be so positive, you'd be happy wherever you were. The point is, you'd still be lost. The fundamental problem has nothing to do with your behavior or your attitude. It has everything to do with having a wrong map. If you have the right map of Chicago, then diligence becomes important. And when you encounter frustrating obstacles along the way, then attitude can make a real difference. But the first and most important requirement is the accuracy of the map. Each of us has many, many maps in our head, which can be divided into two main categories, maps of the way things are or realities and maps of the way things should be or values. We interpret everything we experience through these mental maps. We seldom question their accuracy. We're usually even unaware that we have them. We simply assume that the way we see things is the way they really are or the way they should be. And our attitudes and behaviors grow out of those assumptions. The way we see things is the source of the way we think and the way we act. And so he's, you know, he's taught, he's touching on this maps of meaning thing that Jordan Peterson has since come out and just laid, laid bare, um, you know, for the whole world in stunning fashion. But it's, uh, you know, we, we forget how important it is or, you know, to, to just gather that information, to build that map, that that's like the first step to any successful endeavor that's like the ultimate being in being proactive i think is if before you do anything you make sure that you have the right map if you've never made any effort to get that map then now now is there's no better time than now to get that map and it's you know it's and that i think that goes with with everything you know it's it goes with relationships it goes with hobbies it goes with some undertaking it's like What's the best way to interact with this person? Do I know who this person is even? I mean, do I have any idea what makes them tick? Because as he talks in the, later on in the book, these banks, you know, the trust bank, the emotional bank, for, what, for one person, what might be putting, you know, a deposit into the trust or into the emotional bank, to another person, it could be just tiresome and be depleting that same, you know, that same source. So, you know, this understanding or being able to see or testing yourself and understanding being able to see where your assumptions and all these weird programs and everything that we have where where they lead us astray you know that's that's a really big uh contribution i think on his part well there was one story that he gave in the example oh as an example for habit number five seek first to understand then to be understood so this is relating to what you were just saying Corey. Um, and he gave the example of um, a father that came up to him uh, to share one of his problems. And the, the father told Covey, you know, I just don't understand my son. He doesn't listen to, what, to, what, to anything that I tell him. And then so Covey says, oh, can you repeat that for me? So he did. And he says, well, I, I thought that in order to understand someone, you had to listen to what they say. And he says that the guy just like kind of his jaw kind of opened a bit and he, you know, he could see the, the gears working and he said, Oh he, yeah, I guess, I guess I didn't think about it that way. <laughs> it, t it took a bit more in the conversation for him to make the point that, well, you, if you want to understand your son, you actually have to listen to him. Mm -hmm. And he gives several stories like that often with, you know, parents and their children. And he has this one kind of like extended dialogue. I can't remember if it was, um, if it was a, a real story, story or just one that he kind of, um, you know, composed and put together basically like a, <clears throat> a son telling his father that, you know, he does, he's fed up with school and, uh, he doesn't see the point. And the way the conversation goes, like he says, Oh, you know, my friend Joe, he, he dropped out and he's working as an auto mechanic and, and he's doing great. He's making money already. And the, like the father keeps coming, coming back with like a, interpreting and basically like preaching to the to the kid and using his own 
autobiography. So, oh, you know, you know, when I was a kid, that kind of thing. But then he tells it from like the kid's perspective, what the kid's thinking at, at every point in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And, oh God, here comes the lecture again. Oh, now he's going to tell me about when he was 12 and, you know, going to school uphill both ways in the, in the snow and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then he, then he rewrites the conversation on actually of the, for the father actually listening and not injecting any of his own stuff, not lecturing. And just as one example of a direction the conversation might have gone if the, you know, if the father had just stepped back a bit and just let, just listened essentially. Because he says that's, that's a skill that we don't have that, that isn't taught. He says whenever he's giving like, like, or whenever he would give lectures, you know, he'd ask, okay, well, how many, you know, how many hours do you have learning how to read? And, you know, they'd give, you know, some estimate and how about writing? It's like, well, how many of you have actually learned how to listen? How many, how much time have you spent learning how to listen? You know, no one puts up their hand, mm -hmm. uh, of course, because it's not a skill that's taught. It's just assumed that you know how to listen because it's a, this passive thing, right? You, know, you just sit there and sounds come into your ears. That's all you have to do. But it's actually it's actually a skill that you have to develop. And because, like in the example of the father with his son, um, you, we can constantly inject ourselves, you know, into the, into the conversation. And he gives the example of, you know, a person who, who, you know, complains about something that happened to them. It's like, oh, l listen to what just happened to me. And then the, you have the person that'll say, oh, something like that just ha happened to me too. And then they go into their story about how, you know, the, the bad thing that happened to them. And they, this person has just completely taken over the conversation and turned, you know, turned the attention towards themselves as opposed to listening to what this person, this person was saying, to actually listening. So um, just, yeah, I, I like that one. But there, there are so many others because he's he was basically a consultant in all kinds of things. Like he'd he'd go in and help businesses and entrepreneurs, and I think he advised several presidents mm -hmm. um, at various times. And he's got so many stories about about going in and basically like his intervention, and then the 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 things that the, well the results and the things that change. So he gives one example of like I think it was two business partners, and uh, or at least two people that were. Um, that had to work together, you know, in a, in a close environment. So they were basically um, dependent on each other in this in their positions at this corporation or business or whatever. And so we talked to the to this one guy and and got the this guy psyched up to to have his conversation where he was going to to go in and um, um, kind of try to set things right um, because this other guy was kind of this kind of prickly hard to get along with guy. And, uh, so, so finally the guy goes in and, and just starts the conversation and says how, you know, he was, a, he was afraid of having this conversation. And, uh, these are things I wanted to say. And then he finds out that the other guy was thinking the exact same thing about him and wanting to have this exact conversation. And the air just kind of got immediately lighter. And these guys learned, um, you know, learned how to work together essentially. And there are so many stories like that of just changing a few things, coming at uh, a situation with just a slightly different mindset that um, that defuses the the situation, that 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 makes things lighter, gives pe gives people, I guess, what he would, might call like psychological air. Um, and yeah, it's just it's. Because you, cause you automatically think about all kinds of situations in your life and encounters, and uh, the you know the way things have gone wrong, and and it's really that that approach that that mindset that in a lot of cases is what you know it sounds cheesy but like holds you back or you know uh, what causes you to avoid getting an actual like beneficial results or some, something that uh, is even mutually beneficial. By approaching things with a different attitude, um, there are other possibilities that you hadn't even seen seen as being possible. That and that's this kind of this win-win one plus one equals three or something. It's it's that it's that synergy that that there there are al there are alternative possibilities as opposed to just like either you win or they win. And again, he gives great examples like with uh, with the the mother and the the mother and father, and they've planned a um, like a camping trip with the kids and the mother's, um, or the, the wife's mother is sick and she's worried because 
her mother's pretty old and maybe, you know, maybe this will be the, you know, the, the final illness that does her in, right? And maybe it's the last chance that she'll get to see her, her mother. Um, but they've been planning the entire year for this fishing trip and, um, and, you know, how, how do you make that work? And again, he gives all the kind of possible scenarios. It's like, okay, well, either, either the, the husband can give in and, and, and say, okay, well, we'll go to, you know, visit your mom for this week. And then he's going to be resentful. Um, or the, the wife can decide, okay, well, I'll, I'll go to, you know, I'll go on the trip and I'll, I'll avoid seeing my mom this time. And then, you know, God forbid her mom actually dies. Then she, then the, the husband's going to be going to feel horrible and never forgive himself. And she's not going to forgive him either. And so there, the, there's these two bad situations. And then he uses this as an example in the synergized chapter to, well, you know, if you're actually working together, you can find not only a, uh, like an example, not only an outcome that is good for both of you, but that is better than the, potentially better than either of those, well, it would be better than either of those possibilities. Mm -hmm. And he just gives the example, okay, well, they, you know, they might, they might come up with ideas to find a camping, a camping place closer to where his mother is, or her mother is, or, um, um, go on the camping trip, and then he, the the husband, would put extra effort in to to give her a chance, like the week after, to take some additional time off to to go uh, and visit. And it's yeah, it's just that there are always there are always those those unseen and unimagined possibilities that can come out of the woodwork through um, through this like this practice of inter interdependence based on all these principles. And that really is the, like a creative, um, a creative space to be in. Um, like he gives the examples of, of all these, well, he gives all these examples of what he calls, you know, um, synergy. And that can be anything from, um, like musicians, like all feeling, uh, all being kind of, um, what's the word? Like in sync with each other, mm -hmm. uh, in an in an improvisation, for example, um, that's a, that's a it's a it's an experience that's amazing to to be a part of, but also to witness, um, because you can tell when you when you see it, you can feel it, you can you can see it, you can hear it, and something something great comes out of that. But it can happen in all kinds of environments, and it doesn't like Covey points out, it doesn't have to be one of those rare things in life that you know you just get a glimpse a glimpse of maybe once in your life or every once in a while, that if you are actually living your life based on these principles, that it can be a, a constant thing. You can be like in a constant state of synergy with the people you're involved in, um, with your coworkers, with your family. Um, it really is a product and an outgrowth of the, the character that you've developed and that you've worked on. So I thought that was pretty cool. Well, after having read books like uh, Character Disturbance and a, a number of other books, but also a fair share of self-help books, um, it's uh, it's quite nice to to see a book that, in such kind of simple, accessible language, makes some very basic ideas uh, known and and uh, applicable and um, and and graspable. Um, I'm going to delve a little more into this book. I, I had a chance to do a couple of the exercises in written form. Um, you know, they they weren't so different from from some of the ideas that we had read in books by Gurdjieff. Uh, Gurdjieff, um, you know, he there's a I don't know if it was written. I don't recall if it was written by him specifically, but the you know the last hour of life was either written by him or. Or, or, or one of his students, or one of his no students, one Gene de Salzman. Um, so that eulogy exercise uh, that you mentioned earlier, Corey, you know that that has parallels with it. Um, you know the idea of having uh, a circle of concern versus a circle of influence. I think has a, a nice correlation to. Uh, internal and versus external consideration of other people. Um, so there, clearly, you know, he is drawing on a lot of good material, and 
and is upfront with the idea that, in, in a sense, he didn't even write the book. These were all just ideas that had been out there that he distills for, for folks, um, be they religious or philosophical or, uh, or you know, esoteric. Um, so really good stuff. Uh, one, one last thing I, I wanted to mention here was his idea of private victories uh, preceding public victories, which is, well, I'll just read it. He says, as you become truly independent, this gets back to the um, dependent, independent, interdependent progression uh, that, we, that we might follow as we're working to grow ourselves. He says, as you become truly de independent, you have the foundation for effective interdependence. You have the character base from which you can effectively work on the more personality-oriented, quote-unquote, public victories of teamwork, cooperation, and communication. To maintain the balance, the balance between the golden egg of production and the health and welfare of the goose, what he calls production capability, is often a difficult judgment call. But I suggest it is the very essence of effectiveness. It balances short-term with long-term. It balances going for the grade and paying the price to get an education. It balances the desire to have a room clean and the building of a relationship in which the child is internally committed to do it, cheerfully, willingly, without external supervision. Uh, so, you know, once again, he's kind of like looking at the whole picture and he's saying that, any kind of success worth its salt in life is going to come first as a, a, a little private victory, a victory that you have over yourself, over a bad habit, over a mechanical way of responding to things. Um, and it's out of that victory that the possibility for a, uh, a real interdependence or a growth of being uh, where you can constructively um, incorporate the concerns and the, the lives of, of the people you care about or work with or go to uh, uh, church with. Um, it's, it's out of those private kind of um, victories, those little things or bigger things that you accomplish over the lesser part of yourself that the firmament, the ground from which to, to, to do well with others um, grows. And there was um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was I've read a number of different books on changing habits and the, the best ways that people have found to change bad habits, whatever they may be, or, or to start new habits such as you know, getting up and exercising every day or reading a book or, or whatever it is. Um, and this book takes into consideration and addresses the underlying uh, map that is, you know, what currently constitutes your current habits. And it really, I guess I would say, it is like the best book on changing habits that I've read over the half dozen or so that I have read that really gets to the main crux of the issue, which is that it's not just about, you know, this is a bad habit and there's all these things that I can't control. It is about the way that you're looking at your situation and evaluating it and challenging it to make it into something that is truly who you are and, in it, and your actions become a true expression of who you are and who you want to be and not just something that you're trying to do to please other people. And that's the best way to, to go about making a lasting and uh, effective and productive change. What was the name of the book? Was it Changing Your Habits? or? Uh, well, one of them that I read was, um, what was it? It was Atomic Habits, uh, Making Habits, Breaking Habits. Um, there was a couple more in there, but I can't remember uh, off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, on that note, this is definitely a, a book to read. If you've got some spare time, you've got a 
you know, an evening to yourself, or you can make time to to sit down and read it because it's, you know, it's it's not a self help. It's not a self help book, really. It's a, you know, as it says here in the in the blurb, it's a wonderful book that could change your life. You know, so there's a subtle paradigm shift <laughs> <laughs> just in and of itself. Um, but definitely would highly recommend reading this book. Uh, it's just, it's good soul food type uh, material. And we look forward to speaking again to you next week. Thank you very much. Hit like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Take care.